Hello, everybody's here. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha and good tidings. Hello. Let all your fellow Sangha members into your space and and visit the space of all the other Sangha members. That's what we're here to do. Hmm. Remember to see everyone if you can. Take the time. It actually takes a little bit of time to make sure you see everybody. <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah, it's great. This is the smiling eyes. Mm. The lovely forms, colors, all the beauty, a garden. A garden in bloom. Hmm. Oh, we miss you. as you're looking and touching with your eyes and your heart, just be aware of being and intention to connect, aware of receiving, Uh, the meta energy of connection. Just noticing um, the power of that pure silent awareness that is, is just seeing and receiving without this story. And when a story arises, just notice the story making part of the discursive mind and the separate trajectory of just awareness, energy, focusing, pure, aware, connection, So bring your awareness to the solar plexus area. To know this, this mysterious knowing capacity of the heart mind. And the purity of using the quality of mindful awareness. That cleanses and purifies the heart. So that it is a pure moment to moment stream of knowing, knowing at any of the sense doors, at any of the sense sensitivity the sights and sounds.
mental states and quality, emotions that are up or in the periphery of our awareness in the background. And maybe calling up for our meditation, one of the Brahma Viharas to accompany the stream of silent awareness so that what arises, there's knowing, but perhaps also the connection of goodwill from metta are the very pleasant, sweet caring of compassion accompanying the awareness stream or joy, the delight we all felt when we opened our, our rooms, our homes, our spaces, our hearts, when we started our sangha here a little while ago, to take delight in everyone's presence. or the equanimity, stabilizing, centeredness, groundedness, okay with whatever is experienced at any of the sense doors. And if it helps using the body or the breath as a home anchor. Feeling the body from within the body, not filtered through the head or thoughts or comparing with other experiences as that arises include that in the awareness pastures as just story making. Mind proliferation. Stabilizing with the body or the breath, then lens our entire body, mind, energy field toward calm, tranquility, stability. And we begin to, to feel all the formations of body settling. Even the areas where we might also have some pain and discomfort you feel the rest of the body holding that in a way, the rest of the body that can be filled. And if we feel the stillness of the formations in the body, we can feel the calming of mental formations, mind state emotions, feelings. Always there are little activations that arise from a moment of memory, from, from the thoughts which are uncontrollable. And some they suddenly create another momentary world just to be noticed. And if one of the Brahma Viharas helps expand mental awareness around that other realm or universe or story or the memory, 
then the metta will soften and the compassion will care if there's any imbalance or hurt. And the joy will celebrate with what arises in that new world is delightful. Always we're sidestepping a habit and tendency to proliferate and just feel directly what's happening at the eye door, external visual experience, internal visual experience. We treat them the same, the seen. Awareness of sound helps increase or expand the sense of space, spaciousness. Then abide knowing just the pure hearing vibration. Often right at the ear door, sometimes we feel the sound in the body maybe around the mind door, the solar plexus. And taking care of this, this precious body of ours. Here, the Brahma Viharas are most helpful. We feel good will on a molecular level head to toe, all the mysterious, intriguing ways in which our bodies are woven together like baskets and the network of energy and neurons and tissues. The beauty, the mystery, the magic of that, feeling deeply the body from within the body, it promotes integration, healing, the ability to be with difficult emotions or conditions and to celebrate lovely conditions that arise. Or the centering of the equanimity that's okay with whatever is happening, pleasant or unpleasant. The sacred container of the body is a direct a direct connection to our inner life. To every micro moment of cognition, thought formation arising right now, here and now. or the complexity of the cluster of emotion and thought formation. Sometimes very old, they have no story at all. They arise at the condition of being still. And allowing mind body to unfold on on its own just as it's meant to it's the value 
of returning to feel the body from within the body, to feel the breath from within the breath, to see the connection doing that and the stilling of the mind. The beauty of the mind, the balancing of the heart, mind, body. See for yourself what's true.
it is said in the ancient texts that the sweetest sound in samsara is the sound of the temple bell. And it's so quiet. I'll ring also ring my bell. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen, for your instructions. Thank you. There's a um, kumu, which is the uh, native Hawaiian word, uh, kumu for teacher <clears throat> or source of knowledge, kumu. <clears throat> this kumu, his name is Patrick Makuakani. And he started uh, teaching uh, hula to some of the men in San Quentin prison in, in 2016. And this group uh, had started in 2012, but he, Patrick Makuakane had started in 2016. And there was an interview that I, uh, read recently but with a student of his upu in San Quentin, student there. And he described what his kumu meant to him and what the hula, learning the hula had meant to him. So I wanted to um, offer this, what he said. It's a just, I'm just taking a part of what he said. Kumu has an interesting way of teaching. He'll be subtle. He'll drop a nugget into his explanation. He'll bring in the spiritual part of the hula. He'll show the connection to the earth, to nature. Hula actually made me interested in cleaning up the prison yard. I started to care about the grass. I noticed rocks strewn all over and I would carry them off the yard. The guards were surprised at my initiative. Even my attitude toward the birds changed. You know, San Quentin, it's right by the bay. We had seagulls and pigeons and geese. I couldn't stand them. They'd steal your food. But then after Kumu, I went from throwing rocks at them to feeding them. Hula helped me be a better prisoner, a better husband, a better brother. It made me more mindful. It helped me with external generosity. It helped me to get out of prison and it helped me to stay out of prison. And I wanted to begin the talk with, with speaking to that, that 
through the hula, the spiritual part of the hula, he showed the teacher showed him his the connection, his connection to the earth and to nature. And I think that um, often the the metta practice, the first Brahma Vihara, is so important for us in our practice for that. And I, I know as uh, I've gone through my life, I've really um, witnessed or experienced myself at times um, how no matter how much we do in our life, even really good things like that we might have done so many good things or how much we do but that we, there still can be this sense of um, that we don't feel lovable or we feel like it's we just haven't done enough and there are people who before they die will feel that that they just haven't done enough they just aren't lovable enough because they haven't done enough no matter how much they've done, no matter how much goodness they've expressed. And, and I, so I think that the, um, that kind of misperception where we measure our self-worth by what we do, that we're never enough it, is such a human tragedy. You know, it's, it's such a painful, tragedy to even at our deathbed that we would feel that way. And I think sometimes when we get sick or when we hurt ourselves, we tend to have to look at this more carefully because we can't be doing so much. and We're not having that measuring of ourselves by that external um, measure. And I know for myself, even was when I was a little kid, that that finding the connection with nature, no matter how difficult it was, I would go down to this edge of the lake where near where I lived, and I would just stay there all day until I could feel my goodness. I couldn't have described it like that, but I would feel like some some part of I felt that I came back to something in myself that I could go on. And I, I think that this is um, the sense of that we're, okay, we're, we're lovable just as we are, not based on anything we do. That, that there's this just being is not only good enough, but that that's really the basis of love. And, you know, I, I will talk about how I feel like this intersects our Vipassana practice, but just with our metta practice, that sense of um, understanding that, the, that the, the metaphor the Buddha gave of this was that moment when a mother cow or father cow, the parent cow, looks at the baby calf, that 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 is the experience that he described as metta, as loving kindness. So he's not using an example of a human being. <laughs> he's using the example of a cow in nature. This is important just for us to get that this is not a highly um, remote, far from our body's um, reality. It's like, fundamental to taking birth, to being here. And it, again, it's that, that um, it's not just being, but it, it's just being, but it's feeling that connection, right? Like when we say, when we open up the screen and we say, please make eye contact, <laughs> it's the same thing. It's like, that's what we're trying to bring about is that feeling of like some kind of connection. And the Vipassana brings in that not a sticky connection, 
not sticky, not controlling, but th that it's, again, that fundamental um, feeling all of our goodness, our worth, that has nothing to do with what we do. And in a way, I think that, that um, whether we're on Zoom on retreat or on a Sunday sitting or at a retreat, but one of the great things about it is that I think is that because there's not a lot of talking, we don't necessarily know what we all do, right? Like there isn't a conversation at the beginning of each sitting or each retreat about, well, yeah, I'm a dancer, I'm a potter, I'm a, <laughs> I work at the grocery store, whatever it is, it's like, we don't do that. And I'm not saying that's bad or wrong. I'm just saying that the goodness of it is that we're not having to perform our identity and that we learn to have this connection out of the respect for each person's inherent goodness and connecting with that. And goodness might not be the word. It could be vulnerability or tenderness it, you know sometimes the tr these words um, if we hear it and it doesn't connect you find another word that can help you can find your heart i call it finding finding the heart so that 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 kind of it's i think it's actually very hard for us to not be judging ourselves and others, our behavior, or our thought patterns, or our karmic knots, or, you know, it's like, um, I have this uh, feral cat, three of them, but one of them is allowed sometimes in the house, but because of allergies, she's only allowed on, in certain places, and she knows, she totally knows where she's supposed to be able to be and where she isn't, and lately, she can feel that I'm starting to get ready to leave. And I haven't left for a year and eight months. That's like, I haven't had that happen for me since I was in high school. I, I like, I can't believe it. I, you know, it's so intense. And um, I pulled out my luggage and um, she walked over and looked at it and looked at me. And she immediately did something naughty. Like she, it was like, it didn't even go through the thought process. She just jumped on this bed and I'm like, like, no, you know, you know that you're not supposed to do it. And I love the cats are like, they look at you like, um, I know, I know, I, I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm doing it anyway. Like, it's just like, but I could tell that she just um, actually is really upset that I'm leaving. Because in the past, when I leave, it's usually for two months. It's like really long. And I keep telling her, it's not that long. It's like 14 days, 13 or 14 days. But she, she doesn't understand that. <laughs> you know, she's just like, um, this is not okay. And um, I'm going to do something to bother you. <laughs> you know, it's cool. And I'm just, what I'm trying to say is that for me, I can either start getting upset at her or tune into the loving kindness and correct, try to correct her. I do. And she, she looks at me like, I know I'm not supposed to be up, be up there. That'll last for a while. But as long as that suitcase is out, she's probably going to be doing some things, right? So we know in Vipassana, we, we learn it, but again, all these things are difficult to actually love somebody free of their behavior or love ourselves free of our behavior is actually not that easy. And it requires this understanding again and again and again and again. You know, it's like, uh, whatever. I was yesterday, the other day I was at the gas station and it was crowded and I was just, filling up the tank of gas and this guy in this huge truck pulls up behind me and I could tell he 
had no patience. He had, he just wanted me to leave. And he was like getting more and more frustrated and anxious. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm not going to like not fill my tank with gas, you know, but it was like, he was so, that energy of it was so aggressive and it got very intimidating and aggressive. And I'm like, I'm just <laughs> filling up my tank. Yes. Right. But it was, it's very hard to do meta in these circumstances. Right. Like, you know, all right already. I just okay, you switch to compassion. <laughs> Can't do meta. You switch to compassion. You care about each other. Maybe he's having a bad day, right? Maybe he's in a hurry, right? Whatever you do, but it doesn't, it's really that sense of can we connect with this being like a newborn? like the baby cow. We have a baby cow in us. We have the mother or father cow, cow in us. And often one or the other doesn't have a very strong muscle. <laughs> you know. And if you can uh, care about your own baby cow, you can usually start caring about other people's baby cows or other beings' baby cows. Sometimes I, when I'm going around and there's a lot of uh, behavior dukkha where I'm around, I tend to shift to without conditions. Just as a note, you know, we might note hearing or stepping or whatever, fear, but sometimes I just make little soft mental notes without conditions, without conditions, without conditions. It's not the same as saying metta, but for me, I need to change. I tend to change how I'm practicing and that it can be helpful at times. Now that might not be helpful for you at all. That's like, I'm not saying that is, but it's also helpful to bring about the understanding because loving kindness is basically loving kindness infused with understanding. It is not a superficial love. It's finding a way to relate to all beings as newborns. And when you shift to Vipassana, of course, what's very helpful is that each moment is newborn. So this is where it ties in. It's like the heart is taking birth each moment. Each moment is newborn. Each moment is newborn. Each moment is newborn. And that's why it's so, it, there's so much um, uncertainty in this world. And the, the three characteristics of existence relating to ourselves and others with this understanding of anicca, dukkha, anatta. So of course, when I was waiting to fill my tank of gas and I felt this aggressive energy coming at me, I could start to shift to the intention to understand rather than to judge myself and the other person, right? To try to bring about that. I wasn't just staying with loving kindness or compassion. I was shifting to Vipassana and kind of looking and seeing, oh, is this person afraid? Is he upset, right? It's like, is, can you bring some understanding? And the, the thing that's so important in Vipassana is that the emphasis is on, it doesn't matter what the experience is. What matters is how we're relating to it, right? So I might have a hundred times where I'm standing at this particular gas pump and there's nothing much that happens. In fact, it's not always pleasant or unpleasant. It's often neutral for me. But can I relate to that time just as I do any other time. And this is what, again, you know, unconditional acceptance, you know, the Vipassana equanimity is really treating every experience, every moment equally. So we're not saying, well, I'm not going to investigate this because it's not worthy of my attention or it's too painful or I don't, I don't want to be bothered or that person shouldn't be doing this, right? That's not Vipassana. How are we relating? How are we relating? How are we relating? 
you know, and so I'm going to go backwards and into the metta and into the Vipassana bit here. Sometimes I find that if we don't sort of bring in a little loving kindness each day in our practice, it can kind of slip away. <laughs> you know, it's like it can just get a little bit the the, the attention, the the quality of the awareness with the metta can get kind of rusty. So even if we spend a few minutes every day, it, that's not much. A few minutes where we just find that easy being, that easy part, easy. Maybe it's the sky, maybe it's a tree, maybe it's a caterpillar or a dear friend. It, do, it doesn't matter, but it's meant to be some, some being that's easy for us to connect to the, the goodness. To that ease of it, it doesn't have to be goodness it can be that we wish them well some some way that the heart to pull it back even more it's some way that we feel connected there's some connection the heart isn't um, disconnected with that being or person or place it can be a place and then what I, if I have a few minutes and I'm just, just doing what I'm saying, I might connect with the easy place or being and then myself. Easy place or being and then myself. That's enough to just re-remember, re-remember, re-remember what metta actually is. That it doesn't have to do with measuring ourselves or others by what we do but it's a quality of relating to the being itself worthy all beings are worthy of love this is a, a beautiful haiku from basho uh, who was a great haiku master from japan I lived in the late 1600s into, um, this poem was written September 2nd, 1694, they think. It was written during the Bon Festival in Japan where families offer prayers to the souls of their ancestors. And Basho was attending a service um, for the dead at his um, family area, not the home, but the area. And this woman didn't, this woman who had died, that the, the prayers were being offered, didn't have the status to be in the family shrine, in her family shrine. And so Basho um, knew this woman and was feeling at the service, like how he really wanted her to know how important she had been to him in his life. And he realized he had never told her. And he felt such anguish about her not being allowed in the family shrine and that he hadn't told her how important she was to him. He wrote this haiku. Never think of yourself as someone who did not count. Festival of the souls. Never think of yourself as someone who did not count. Festival of the souls. So this is a practice of, of gradually strengthening the heart of metta, loving kindness. It's not that you just, it just happens or that it doesn't go rusty. It's, it's a practice and um, it cannot be done with force or willpower 
we have to start where we are. So it's just finding, uh, it can be a grass blade. It can be a cat, it can be a anything, a fish. And the idea is that when we do this any way that, I'm just suggesting a few things, but really any way that this, you find the entry point to the heart and then can practice it a little bit, then you can strengthen it. You can start with all beings in the whole universe and shift to, you know, to the planet, to like your neighborhood, to yourself, your body, right? You can go from way out to deep inside, or you can start deep inside, fill up your body, kind of move out neighborhood, out to all beings everywhere, or you can do some kind of um, whatever comes up, macro, micro, deep inside. You know, it's like, it's, it's really a matter of sort of trusting again. For me, I had to start kind of out, but not too far out of my body and gradually come in. Some people start way deep inside and come out. But the idea is that whichever way you are, wherever you are in it, you um, fill it up. You infuse your body or you infuse the universe or it's like the sense of um, gradually, finding that um, metta that isn't bound by space and time or behavior. So there's a, a, a grand flexibility with this practice. I have been staying in touch with my neighbor where I grew up outside of Boston um, as I think in two weeks, she's leaving the house that she lived in for 60 years. And um, now there's many trips. She was doing many trips to Goodwill or just in there and now and giving, they gave all their furniture to the neighbors. And now it's um, the dump. And she said, uh, that she's feeling very connected to everyone that ever lived there, especially the dead ones. And so my father is, of course, and my family uh, are, are some of the dead ones, <laughs> as well as two live ones left. And um, I just thought that was so beautiful that, and then where they're going, she's like, I'm not sure who's gonna be alive where I'm going. So it's like, she's kind of in that world of just feeling metta for people alive and dead. And it's not like, there's not like a priority of which, which is which. And she said, I'm just happy, she's 84. I'm just happy I'm still on the planet. And she said, I feel like I'm jumping off a cliff with no safety net. Uh, but it's helpful that I don't feel like I have to know anything anymore. Not easy at 84 to jump, right? I was reflecting on that, that the Suzuki Roshi's uh, description of mindfulness as being soft readiness, that soft readiness and that the understanding that I started to receive from Sayada Upandita that Vipassana is developing a mind that's ready for anything to happen that the mind is strong enough to be ready for anything to happen because the truth is that anything can happen. And so one isn't, one isn't second guessing, right? One isn't expecting pain or pleasure or neutral. One isn't caught up in that kind of negativity or optimism or negative positive, or it's not like that. It's more, you just, you just know there's pain in the world. There's pleasure in the world is neutral. And they're just, just like, my friend Linda is just like, just not knowing. You just don't know what's going to happen next. 
but there's a readiness. One understands there's pain, right? One understands there's pleasure. One understands there's neutral, that that's how things are, but that you can't control the appearance. So the, the sense of kind of a, a increasing solitude or increasing quiet or increasing peace comes from the understanding that we can just let things be just being. But that includes our thoughts. It's like Steve was sharing today. It's like you just, you don't, you just let them be. But you see, you're not letting yourself get inundated by them and believing them. And you're not pushing them away. You're inclusive. You're just letting them be. You, you don't have to do anything with them. And emotions, like it's the same. It's like no matter whether there's fear or sadness or loving kindness or, you know, that range of despair, aversion, attachment, boredom, you know, joy, <laughs> laughter, neediness, you know, the whole range of, and even time and timelessness, stress, stress and reassurance and peace, all of that. We're just learning not to do anything with them. but we're investigating them. There's not a, a idea that we have to get rid of anything. It's so inclusive. So we don't have to be caught in expecting, expectation, expecting the good, expecting the bad, expecting indifference. Like it, you know, it's like that. It's that expectation that kills connection, which kind of circles around the beginning of the talk. That it, this is about connection without controlling, connection without controlling. There's um, that exquisite understanding that each moment is is taking birth and passing away. That 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 price of aliveness is is this exquisite birth, death, birth, death, birth, <laughs> and um, there's a poem. Today's a Basho day uh, by Basho. This one is translated by Aiken Roshi, uh, the great Zen teacher in Honolulu. It's said he wrote this, um, Basho wrote this in 1689, and it, it's considered from his masterpiece, The Narrow Road to the North. He took um, many journeys, difficult long journeys in Japan at that time, 1689. Um, they were not easy. And uh, this is said to be a farewell to his friends and disciples as he was about to depart. Uh, but I also think of it as every moment. Spring departing, birds cry out, tears in the eyes of fish. Spring departing, birds cry out, tears in the eyes of fish. to just think that the fish cry when there's a departing. I 
I think of this poem as a very deep inspiration to be interested in what is hidden in this moment to moment change, the Vedana, pain, pleasure, neutral. And often we just miss, if we're feeling defeated by something, we met, we're actually missing that we're, we're actually defeated by aversion to pain. It's not the pain in the world. It's the aversion to the pain. We're just not interested in it. We're not willing to change to that being the object of the attention. We're not valuing aversion or fear or anger as, as something so worthy of us to pay attention to. And the same with attachment. It's like, uh, it's like we get caught up in wanting the pleasure and caught up in the object of the pleasure rather than shifting the attention back into being interested in wanting something and wanting things to be different. There's sort of two sides of the same coin, yeah. And just like that they're, they're so hidden from us most of the time because we think we're, you know, we're above it. We don't have to be interested in it. And yet it's like really underneath the whole show of suffering. I think of birds crying out and tears in the eyes of fish as sort of the way the whole, all of nature is with us, like in this, we're in that boat of anicca, everything changing, this aliveness, and how do we relate to it with peace rather than aversion and attachment? Well, we got to get interested in it. How, do, how does that play out? I have a, um, a double peacocky plant bush in my yard. Uh, peacocky is the Hawaiian word for jasmine. And the double peacocky, um, is a double double whammy of the scent of jasmine, and it flowered yesterday afternoon. So I um, kind of forgot how allergic I am. <laughs> of course, I'm allergic to everything, and I I brought it in, and I I did have a whisper of sort of memory of like I thought, well, bet, I better not leave it in a place where I'm hanging out much, and I put it in this hallway. <laughs> and this morning, I like I was just like. The, the the scent of this flower had just filled my whole house. Like it felt like it just would have filled the whole universe. Um, it was so amazing. Uh, and I think of um, the fragrance of peace, like the fragrance of metta, loving kindness, that the, the scent of one moment you might have where you, you have the intention to understand rather than to judge. If there's a scent to it, there's a fragrance to it. And it's so important to remember that, like that, do we count? <sighs> Not only do we count, but one moment of love and kindness super counts. <laughs> one moment of mindfulness. The Buddha said, one moment of mindfulness is better than a hundred years of no mindfulness. It's pretty amazing. Ring my little bell.
Thank you, Michelle. So we have some time for uh, questions, if anyone has any about your practice or questions about the instructions or Michelle's talk, anything we can support you with. The, um, on the reactions button on the bottom of your screen, if you click on that, there should be a little button that says raise hand. That's the easiest way for us to see you have a question. And if you can't find that, even typing something in the chat to let us know, we'll find you. Hey Kay, I think you can um, unmute there. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm I'm noticing that I'm not interested in la laziness or um, <laughs> uh, I'm not interested in un unawareness, not paying attention is, I don't know how to ask this question. Um, how would I be interested in uh, laziness or not working hard or um, not paying attention. I guess if you're paying attention to not paying attention, you're paying attention, but um, I think there's a lot of resistance to that um, that leads a lot of frustration, aversion, and I'm just wondering how to work with laziness. Jesse, you want to start? Or... The great insult, laziness. <laughs> Do you want me to start? Yeah, no, I, I'll start. I, yeah, I think yeah. um, I've said this before, but one of my favorite monks in, at Chazwa in Burma, um, Uzinji, um, uh, he had a very similar sense of humor as me, which was really, really fun and delightful. And um, his favorite insult, like about somebody or himself, like a real insult, like down and down and, and dirty insult would be if some oh that person's lazy and and when he would say that person's lazy we would both go into hysterics because like it's also it's also how I was raised like it's the worst thing you could say about somebody it's so funny you know and so um I think that I would ask you to look at your motivation because technically the idea isn't that something's wrong with work or doing, but, or there's something wrong with laziness. It's more just like, how are we relating to it? And what I think you're saying is that the just being part, which, you know, could be more of your moments, right? Like the, the valuing just being, which I, I'm wondering if you're calling lazy, uh, so I'm asking you, is is that true that you're calling just being lazy? No, I think okay. that I think when there's even not doing anything and there's attention to it, it feels 
peaceful and whole. Um, I, different word popped up, carelessness. I, I uh, cannot connect with carelessness with myself or uh, other people. And, and then it becomes really um, conditional love or conditional compassion. <laughs> um and it just burns out um and it just very it's very it, it ends up being very painful for myself i don't exactly know about other people so um this ends up being painful for myself so so does this mean like if if you do anything like say you broke a glass in the house would that is that an example yeah that's a great example yeah because I have that the water plant or right yeah so you have a punishing a punishing re reaction well I would guess that you learned it most of us learn we learn these things pretty young um, and for some reason for me I, I know why when I was a kid why a broken glass me breaking glass would be so um, catastrophic but um, boy when I break a glass I have to kind of just stop and sit down go outside and just kind of really do a lot of metta and compassion because it's almost like I murdered somebody it's that that was my conditioning and so I think that depending on you know for somebody else they might feel bad about it you know because you know, nobody likes to like break something but that level of like un, you know how would you relate to a little kid if they broke a glass in the house you probably wouldn't relate to them like it was a murderous act would you no but if they keep <laughs> breaking like 10 glasses i might Right. If they had a temper tantrum and broke them. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's aversion. Yeah. Perfectionism. That's a, this is kind of like the thing I was saying about before we die. And this is something that's so important because that, that, um, it's like this addiction, Marian Woodman, a great writer um, from Canada, she called it addiction to perfection. It's like this, it's such, it's just like, it's so punishing versus like shifting to understanding. And often, um, I mean, with more serious behavior, if we understand that there was harm to oneself or others, uh, I think that the practice teaches us to, like you say, see the see the upa, the apamada as carefulness, that the lack of care care that we're human beings, we make mistakes that we actually learn from it and try to do better. You know, it's like when we really harm and. Um, it means you have a conscience. Some people don't even have a conscience. I think it's, it's, it's really, again, to see the, the harm that we do to ourselves or others with that um, lack of flexibility and lack of loving kindness and the, the response as a, that we're bad you're bad, you're a bad person, I'm a bad person, I'm no good. And then the, you know, the, the, the steady climb into hopelessness and despair, and complete, utter unlovability, you know, that's, you have to see how unhelpful it is and not true, it's not the truth. Jesse, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think I, I I would say sort of within what Michelle is answering too of like that to remember the frameworks of like the whole spectrum of like 
practice in relationship to neutral experience versus like deep in the, in the spectrum of like incredibly pleasant or incredibly unpleasant experience. And that sense of when there's the mindfulness and, and again, it's like, I, it really does feel like this is not always what we have internalized in terms of our, what we think our training is around practice. And there's a way that there's a sense of like our, the practice should always be, it's like full force uh, interest and investigation and anything that's happening. And the truth is, is that's really not what we teach, right? We teach a sense of when the mind is, is feels strong, when the mind feels uh, flexible and um, has some connection with kindness and pliable and all of these qualities, then we can kind of have a broader palette of experience that we can engage with in a healthy way. Um, but when it's not, right, when the mind is contracted or when there's fear or when there's a lot of intensity and not as much access to equanimity and tenderness and peace, all of these things, then we really do encourage to not go into the hardest things, right? To not try to explore the hardest things because you're not going to have a successful interaction with them, right? You're not going to have a fruitful engagement with them. You're going to drown in them and it's like so then this like go to something neutral give yourself a break find some distraction that's healthy find kind of along the lines of what michelle was saying it's like okay how do you pull out of the vortex of a kind of thing a black hole or like something that's like so powerful right that's going to pull you in and what's hard is like to recognize those things in the day-to-day -day. sometimes you know, when you're on retreat and you start to get a sense that there's like something more sort of consuming and overwhelming coming and like, okay, then you know how to kind of deal with it. But when it's these sort of day-to-day -day things that happen, mistakes, for example, right? Using your last example, that are sort of maybe not happening in the context of a lot of intensity, but and maybe are happening more frequently. Sometimes the sort of like the information isn't there to remind us that this is actually like a huge trauma thing for us right and actually we need to be super careful because it's sort of they it, it's more so familiar right and so i would just say that of like don't try to be interested in it because it's actually a very it's part of a very deep karmic knot for you and it's it's something that's like actually very difficult to have a healthy relationship with so that in a general sense it's like the more instinct should be like oh okay you get you see yourself sort of spiraling into it and so it's like what do you do what are the tools to kind of actually get you out of it versus trying to do what you feel like you should be doing which is like i should be interested in this i should be interested in these parts of myself that i hate or that i feel guilty about or i've shared my parents and my it's like whoa, 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 right and it's like wow we like back off we get space we find ground elsewhere and then yeah are there times where there's like a way to develop a relationship but when when the mind is strong when you're feeling sort of really capable a sense of is there access to tenderness compassion right of feeling the child part of yourself or or what have you or the pain of of the self-judgment the, the pain of the lack of valuing or lack of patience with ourselves around certain things um yeah of course there are times where we can engage those and we can have um more fruitful interaction with them but in general, when we're just kind of going through our daily lives, it's like it's something to be very careful of, you know. And so I think it's a, it's a great question because it's 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 we're just not often so um, attuned to to treat things with that much respect in our daily life. To really be like, oh, this is a very serious practice question, actually, and I need to actually really kind of be very careful with how I'm treating the mind and treating myself in these in these following moments and then the next hour and then maybe the next hours you know i don't know as an aside to it, i mean as a related thing it, it, I've, I've i've came upon this book about exercise it's called exercised and i guess i didn't know this word exercised also means like to be like anxious and stressed about and so this way that like we have this relationship with the idea of exercise that is actually really stressful and anxious producing. And anyway, long story short, there's like, I've only just started, I read a little bit of the intro and how this notion that like, that's so like contemporary 
and probably started as a more Western thing, but now is sort of, you know, broader than that. This idea that we should enjoy exercise, right, is like totally ridiculous. And there's like no traditional cultures would ever and and one and 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 like cultures around the world where people are still like really working hard all day long like physically and toiling away in fields and like having to survive by doing that this notion that like you're supposed to enjoy it or that you would take your free time to go like suffer right for like a sort of abstract notion is like ridiculous you know and um anyway i do think this this goes more goes back to your laziness point i think like this training we have around like thinking we should like to work or like like to do these things that we have to do right that like that somehow that this is like it's immoral that we don't enjoy like paying the bills and doing our taxes and working you know and it's like of course you don't like it so i think there's like there's another sort of sort of like dynamic around the laziness piece that i think is actually really healthy to, to to play around with and counteract you know as much as possible of being like why do we when you have this when there is the strength of mind where it's like we're not going to just go into self-judgment yeah the sense of like why where, where does this belief come from right really kind of like um it's that level of interest that is that can be very helpful right it can be that has a strength that might have a little bit of like um uh intensity to it of really really trying to get underneath the the loop we're in of like why do i even value this thing like why am i really where, where is that coming from and um i guess it's just to say that the the inquiry aspect of investigation when we're, we're saying i don't feel like i can be interested in laziness or interested in um carelessness or mistakes it's like maybe there's a maybe the target is just a little bit off, that the interest is actually in the assumption of something, not in the thing that we think it's supposed to be in. Maybe it's not the, it's not interest in laziness, but where's there interest in like the judgment around it, right? Is there interest in like, oh, why do I have this belief or where is this coming from? Um, sometimes it's actually just a little slight shift that can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, really important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Tang, do you have a question? Oh, we'll see. Audrey. Oh, we'll start with Audrey and then Tang, if you have a question, we'll, yeah. Okay, yeah, good yeah. idea. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much, um, all three of you for your teachings. So, so grateful. Um, my question is just wondering if um, you would talk about concentration and ways of uh, thinking about and practicing concentration, because um, I just appreciate, uh, I remember Michelle, um, a few months ago, you talking about um, breaking moments into micro moments and how we can't even, you know, hear a whole bird call. We just have to hear, hear part of it because our, the mind is just so fast and flitting. Um, I find myself um, just wondering about, um, actual just practicing concentration, that muscle. Um, yeah, that's all, thank you. I was just gonna ask, did you wanna say something, Michelle? I just will say something about okay, we talk a we chara. Uh, there's like kind of technically, in Vipassana, we're doing momentary concentration because we're paying attention to change. And um, how you start to understand it is that 
the there's two parts to it. There's a the there's like this kind of thing we call attention, which in itself is very interesting. What is it? But then the the we talk of the Pali word we talk of means that you're you're trying to connect the attention with something that's actually moving. That's that's how life is. So the you say it's a sound, you, you try to connect the attention either here or kind of out where the sound is, you try to connect it to the experience of the sound. And then what might be helpful for you is to understand that um, it's hard to stay with something changing because we actually don't like it. We don't like that it's changing. It's, it's hard. It's like every, everything you pay attention to in Vipassana is moving. And so whether it's with the breath or with a step, you know, just the fundamental, if I want to move my arm from, from here over to here, if, I'm, if I connect with the beginning of that movement as it's moving, it's going to be a lot of different sensations. We, we can't just nail it down and control it if you're paying attention carefully. So the, the first thing is to understand why is it so hard? It's not your fault. It's not the human being. You know, it's, it's like what, what's important is that the more you understand impermanence, then the more you have a little bit more fun with this, which is like I try to just teach. If you can connect with something, just see what happens if you connect with the sound of a bird because if you if you're having trouble with this of course you're going to want to start with some easier things for me i always tried to do birds because birds because i had enough interest i could connect and the the, the tricky part is having a receptive attention where you can receive the sound and notice the textures and vibrations as they change and then, of course, you see if you can notice the mend. So this is whether you're with the lifting and moving and placing of a foot or chewing um, a banana, you know, <laughs> swallowing it, or you, you try to take certain things that might be a little bit easier for you and see if you can connect, sustain just for a few seconds. And then it might be enough for a while, like <laughs> take a little break. And then you try it again and you take a little break and you try again and you take a little break. So you're not too heavy. You don't have a heavy hand. Um, and taking a break will mean that you're not, you're, trying, you're not trying to notice any change. So you can have your attention with the movement of the breath and just synchronize the attention with it. And you're not necessarily noticing that it actually takes birth and dies and disappears every time. Or every step takes birth, lives and dies every time. It's like that's when that that's what's hard about this. And you're, you're trying to do enough of the lighter concentration where you're just trying to synchronize the attention with things as they're moving. And, um, and then when you have enough interest, you try to shift it to noticing the change. That's the quick answer. I, I'm hoping um, Jesse might have something to say, but really it's just finding a few things to um, be interested in. And then even with the other thing I'm saying, lightly, just lightly be with um, the sound of the wind or a step or uh, eating or all these things. You're not trying to get to the bottom of it. You're just trying to show up for it. Go ahead, Jesse. I, I I, yeah, I think I, I'm curious of like where the question is coming from. Is it, do you have a sense that you're not able to be concentrated? You'd like to be more concentrated or you're just generally interested in it? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, so um, I generally feel um, it's, it's on Sunday nights when I sit and listen to your talks, I always record them and listen to them again. Um, because um, I find that um, you know, my mind is just, of course, just takes off. Something that you say triggers some thoughts and I'm gone and I you know, finally come back and it just keeps happening. And so I was just um, really curious what your thoughts are on that. And um, just sort of a, you know, there's the sort of the technical aspect of, 
of practicing concentration, but then there's also the attitude about it. And um, yeah, I was just wondering what you would think if that were you. Mm -hmm. That is me. Wait, so what, are, when you say the attitude about it, like yeah. the, your, your response to the sense of being concentrated or not, or tell, say a little more what you mean by the attitude. Oh, yeah. about oh thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. So while it's happening, I'm, and I feel really sad about it. Like I feel, um, um, yeah, I feel a little bit sad and at times I'm almost panicky, you know, just like, um, um, definitely uh, feel like I should be able to concentrate. Mm -hmm. And um, it's frustrating and it's a little bit scary and it's confusing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the what's sort of the humorous part to me of it, and the great part of it, is is like a. It's just like there's something really <laughs> beautiful about how much mindfulness it takes to see how unconcentrated you are, right? It's like that 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 seeing what you're seeing actually requires a lot of mindfulness <laughs> and so there is this sort of fun way in which they are like you know they're so intertwined and related to one another and and the, that relationship is so mysterious and and to really i think what can be hard is to take that to heart because there sometimes or, or frequently you know the more mindful we are the more we see the well the more we see the truth of things and sometimes those things are the truth of the mind right or it's like when we look at the truth of undependability right or impermanence um the the the, the that's that aspect of dukkha of undependability that that isn't just in the external things we're observing that's in the mind itself that's doing the observing Right. So there's actually like a lot of wisdom that's available in that understanding and that insight of just like, oh, the, the mind itself is so undependable and so impermanent. And this sense of like, it's connected and then it's not. It's connected and then it's goes, And then it goes here and then it goes there and it goes there. And so I think it's so much more important to see that but to see it from a stable place right not one that is sort of judgmental and 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 seeing the flaws of the mind and the imperfection and the ultimate sort of like how long we've we been doing this and i still can't listen to this whole thing without wandering off or like that the fact that you're seeing it is uh so much more important than the ability to not have the mind wander at all for 40 minutes or something like that right which isn't to say that that isn't an incredible capacity of the mind, right? That the mind actually can be trained to do that. And there's sort of like mixed benefits to that. There's a stability, there's a solidity, but you can also see there's like an identification that's gonna come with that of like, oh, I did it, right? I can do this. And that's like so, that's so one of the downsides of concentration is this sense of like, power and, and identification with power. And, um, and it might seem, and that might be seem overstated <laughs> around like what you're saying, but it's exactly the same It's a small version of like the, of, of the ways that could, you know, if you're trying to move objects with your mind or whatever, right. It's like, it's the same problem. It's the same dynamic. <laughs> and so, um, or like levitate, you know, it's like the, the, the identification that's there. And so the, the danger of like this, this over prioritizing concentration versus mindfulness is sort of ever present. And it is a big part of why, you know, Michelle's kind of explaining why there's such a focus and a valuing of momentary concentration over absorptive concentration, which isn't to say there isn't a value to it, that it isn't very much acknowledged and that the mind is capable of such incredible kind of things with that. Um, but actually what you're seeing is so much more important. And so I would just say the tricky part there is to see the, 
to actually look closer and to rather than being so identified with the fallibility of the mind, the fallibility of the capacity of concentration, seeing this as the nature of things, right? It's like, yes, this is the nature of things. And yes, there are things we can do to sharpen or to strengthen blah, 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 all that. And um, that you're seeing what's happening in the present moment. And of course you lose it and you come back and you lose it and you come back. That mindfulness of whatever is happening applied consistently builds concentration. It's not just mindfulness of hearing over time or mindfulness of breathing over time or mindfulness of certain sensations that build concentration. Of course, there is something about concentrating on a particular range of objects of experience that builds a quality of concentration. But the momentary concentration that Michelle is talking about is like, well, it, it doesn't matter if it's sensation in the foot, a thought, a smell, a touch, a mind, a mind, a mind, a mind, a body, a mind, a body, 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 mind, 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 whatever. It's like whatever's happening in the present moment, the mindfulness keeping reapplying at that, wherever sense door it's at or whatever pleasant, unpleasant, neutral preference, that is actually building concentration, 100%. And so to, to have some place where you appreciate that you're seeing the truth of things before you get into the sort of negative self-perception of it and sticking with it's like, oh, the clarity of like, oh yeah, the mind is undependable and seeing that as liberatory rather than as like a prison, you know? Hmm. Yeah, it's great. It's so humbling. The practice is supposed to be humbling, <laughs> you know, and like more humble than we can conceive of, really. Yeah. I don't know, Michelle, you want to add anything? I think I just say what I said again, which mm. is you just do a few seconds. I mean, it's just like this is that's it's no big deal. It's just like it, I think that if you're trying to do more than you can do it, it's upsetting and scary and all the things that you describe but if you see that you can't control it but you can just do the best you can to show up and that's what i mean you try a little and then you just start again and you start again and it's all about <laughs> it's all about beginning again whether you have a you're upset at somebody you live with or down the street or it's like eventually you have to start again or if you can't like be with 10 steps and you suddenly come back and you're there for that step, you start it again. Like it's, that's all you can do. You can't force it, but you can keep trying to put yourself in the conditions where the attention, the, the oh, okay, great place to end with this. It's very inviting to your whole being if when you come back to the present moment, there isn't a big judge there saying, you're not doing this right. I can't do this. Like you're not, you're, you're not, you're just a lousy crap because you can't meditate right. If you have a big judge there, like, would you want to come back? Would your attention want to come back to the present moment? If you've got a judge looming there that about to attack you for every time you don't think you've done good enough, of course not. Why would, why would your attention come back? It's like, it's not inviting. That's what my talk was about. It's an invitation to show up, see what happens, and pretty within a few seconds, the attention's gonna be gone. But it's accepting that for all of us, it's accepting that that's how it is. And we keep holding out for more control. We keep holding out for more control and holding out for more control and holding out for more control. Rather than, and then it's, it's a shift to, I call it wisdom, the gradual lowering of expectation, the gradual lowering of expectation. Until like Jesse says, you're so humble. You're just like, oh, okay, I don't really know anything. Thank you. I have to say that it really is, it's a sadness. I, I don't, it's more sadness. When, when during Steve's talk, um, when he suggested that we use one of the four Brahma Viharas, um, 
it was really what I kept applying was um, compassion, you know, not not just to um, to my own experience. Well, just recognizing that, that I was concerned about so many things, which was what was pulling my attention away and just recognizing uh, just the love in, in all of that. Um, but anyway, thank you. That's so beautiful. Much. It's like, yeah, we, we want, we worry because we care. We're sad because we care. We want to be here more because we care. Um, when you're in touch with that care, there's, there's more access to the sadness. It's a good thing. Hmm. Hmm. I, I would just say when we're in touch with that, just the pure care. It's that again, that coming back to just caring. Not the objects of the care. And not the behavior, as Michelle was saying earlier, it's like, this is mental behavior. And if that, if that is our, the, the metric by which we're measuring ourselves, um, there's just so much suffering in that, yeah. As if it was under our control, right? Because if it was, we would just concentrate. <laughs> that can either be concentrate, a, a command, a command concentrate, or like, oh, well, I didn't concentrate. <laughs> either one, oh, well. <laughs> hmm. Mindfulness is not under our command. Hmm. Well, on that note, it seems like a good place to end. Hmm. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you for coming, showing up for the Sangha. Mm -hmm. mm. Steve tried to get back in and say, good, you know, he had to go do something urgent. So like he just sent his love. So uh, okay. yeah. have a great week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>